You're welcome back to the conversation in New Central Television. We now switch gears from Nigeria to the southern part of the continent, Zimbabwe. The Zimbabwean authorities have deported regional democracy activists and barred journalists from covering the upcoming general elections. Among those denied entry were Chris Maroleng, executive director of Good Governance Africa, and its colleagues who were turned away based on security orders. Meanwhile, foreign media organizations like the Voice of America, ARD of Germany, and Daily Maverick were also denied clearance without reasons provided in a separate development. Uh, the former chairman of Nigeria's Independent National Electoral Commission, Professor Atahiru Jaga, has been named by Carter Center to lead its international election observation mission to Zimbabwe. Mission was initiated in response to an invitation from Zimbabwean authorities and subsequent accreditation of observers by the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission. Now, joining me live from Zimbabwe to discuss this is Tapi Wadashe Chiriga, Advocacy Officer at Heal Zimbabwe Trust, and also Dr. Alexander Rusero, International Relations and Political Analyst. A warm welcome to you both, and thanks for joining me on the conversation. This evening. Sure. Now I'd like to start with you, Dr. Rosero, with the recent deportation of regional democracy activists and the refusal to grant entry to journalists. Could you elaborate on the potential ramifications of this actions on the perceived legitimacy of Zimbabwe's upcoming general elections, both within the country and on the international stage? Yeah, I think it's more about the, the international uh, posture. And uh, thank you for having me uh, on this program. Because at the end of the day, it doesn't give Zimbabwe a good uh, standing, especially with regards to the attractiveness uh, of the state. You don't want to witness a scenario where a country deports uh, foreign nationals uh, five days ahead of an election when all eyes are gazed on Zimbabwe, primarily because almost all observer missions are already here. So it, it doesn't sit well in as much as issues of uh, the posture of the Zimbabwean state, the attractiveness of the Zimbabwean state is concerned. But more importantly, with regards also to the credibility of uh, the election, also to the notions of whether Zimbabwe is going to pass uh, the credibility test of that election being free and fair. You do not want to have a poll that is supposed to be deemed free and fair when others are bad, just in, 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 a, a mere exercise of news gathering, uh, a mere exercising of also witnessing the polls as they unfold. So it's actually a sad day for Zimbabwe in as much as its democratic posture is concerned and in as much as uh, its uh, aspirations as cons to be considered as a serious electoral democracy uh, is also concerned. It reduces the whole election into, into a charade, mm. uh, more or less of uh, some ritual uh, exercise to legitimize uh, ZANU-PF's rule. Now, Dr. Alexander Rosero, President to Emerson Nangagwa's dual messages, one in election observers not to interfere, but also at the same time taking actions that seem restrictive appear paradoxical. How do you interpret this contradiction and uh, could it reflect deeper tensions within the Zimbabwean government's approach to the electoral process? No, I think it does not reflect any tensions. But, you know, ZANPF is a, is a vicious political animal, which is also very cunning on one end, on, and on the other, very complex and difficult to, to, to deal with. You, you have to understand ZANPF is a modus operandi in that respect, because it is a party which has got a habit of indicating left and turning right. So there, there is really nothing here other than just a strong message being sent. It's a demonstration. It's a posture uh, on the extent at which ZANU-PF is serious, especially whenever it feels that uh, its uh, power consolidation 
is under threat. So th there is really nothing much in terms of contradiction, tensions. It, it's just uh, one of those paradoxes, as you rightly point out, that the party has got a tendency of indicating left and then immediately turns right. We, we have seen it uh, for, for a long time. That, that's ZANPF's way of doing t things. It exactly does what it does not say and say what it does not do. I don't know what it is in, in politics to do exactly the opposite of what you say you and say the exact opposite of what you will do. Now, Dr. Rosero, delving into the motivations behind the selective barring of certain individuals in media outlets, <clears throat> uh, could you provide an insightful analysis of the strategic objectives that the ZANU PF government might have in mind? How do these actions align with or diverge from the government's stated commitment to transparent elections. I know you just said, you know, ZANU-PF says one thing and does the opposite. But why have they decided to selectively bar uh, certain individuals and media outlets? I think it's historical. Uh, it's very historical. Um, it's not ad hoc. Uh, you, you just profile the, those who have been barred and those who have been deported. These are people that are perceived to have been very hostile uh, to the ZANU-PF-led uh, government. These are people that are actually deemed as enemies uh, of the state. So ZANU-PF is very, very particular when it comes to who to deal with and who not to deal with. Uh, once uh, they, you cross their Rubicon line, uh, they hardly reconcile. So if you look at uh, uh, Chris Marilong and his team, for example, if, if you profile him and his works and what he has been producing in as much as his researches are concerned, especially pertaining Zimbabwe, and I think a certain opinion, newspaper opinion piece that he produced, um, I think less than two weeks from now, uh, prior to his uh, travel to Zimbabwe, it was very clear uh, that the Zimbabwean government was never going to fold the hands. Uh, ZAN PFSI uh, was never going to fold the hands. Because at the end of the day, uh, to ZAN PF, their perception is that the so called research that this, uh, this crew wanted to, 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 to conduct was kind of a, a delayed match of coming to validate the results that they already have. And ZAN PF had to, to prove them otherwise. But with regards to journalists, I think there are two things at play here. History that I have alluded to, you know, the likes of Voice of America have for a long time been perceived as hostile uh, broadcasting sessions. But there is a lot of activity and a lot of um, a correspondence of a VOA in, in, in Zimbabwe who are actually carrying out their duties freely. Uh, I have actually this week alone, I have provided more than five uh, uh, soundbite analyses uh, to different VOA uh, um, uh, correspondents. So it becomes very personal to the particular individual in question because uh, the, the, the kind of a security system in Zimbabwe, it, it does a lot of profiling behind the scenes before you are granted those accreditation. But more importantly, I think for these journalists, their timing also was very poor because the whole accreditation activity was taking place for a long time. So it was very unwise and unstrategic on their part to, to be trying to do this uh, last minute. Mm. Uh, they could have done so when things were still a little bit reluctant and not as, they, the, as tense as they are slowly becoming a few days before the election. Thank you very much, Dr. Alex Rosero. I would like to bring in, uh, at this point, our second guest in this conversation, Tapu Wanashe uh, Chiriga. He is an advocacy officer at Hill Zimbabwe Trust. A warm welcome to you, uh, Tapu Wanashe. Yeah. Uh, Tapu Wanashe, the True Zimbabwe Tour raises intriguing questions about the government's image management, could you explore the broader context in which this initiative was conceived, its potential impact on shaping perceptions, and how does it fit into the larger narrative of Zimbabwean politics when discussing the potential move to save face by restricting foreign media? Could you pinpoint a specific elements of the election that, uh, that authorities 
uh, might be aiming to shield from international scrutiny. In Jiang China, or history of the country, I think we must point out that uh, President Mnangagwa really does not care about the image anymore. What he cares about right now is hiding his electoral shenanigans that have been happening since the proclamation date, hiding them from the world. So he would rather hide his electoral shenanigans than, prote than, than protecting the image uh, of the country or of, at least of his government to the world. So I think he has he had two options. Number one, protecting his image, but also exposing his electoral shenanigans. And number two, it was soiling his image by barring these uh, observers and, and international media, and then protecting his electoral shenanigans that would obviously cut up out him to, to contested victory. So I think we must also mention the fact that in Zimbabwe right now, there are local observers who have been denied accreditation. I myself have been declared what they what the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission is termed um, a security risk. They've denied my my accreditation as a local uh, observer. Uh, and from why Zimbabwe. why do you think they did that? What's the reason behind what's the rationale behind them denying you uh, accreditation to cover the elections? Tapu Wanashi. Yes, we, we wrote through our lawyers to them and they said that uh, we they denied our accreditation as a secure for, for security reasons. They did not exactly they did not exactly state any reason. So we can only speculate that maybe the kinds of work that you have been producing over the past few months regarding this election, regarding the, the many of manipulation that is that be that has been served, uh, particularly in the rural areas. I think that has been that has angered them because we've worked so hard in as far as uh, exposing their shenanigans using uh, the pseudo security and civil society organization that support them in as far as intimidation and violence in the rural areas is concerned. So I think that would only be the reason why they have denied some of a number of our staff members from the EU Zimbabwe uh, accreditation. I hear that also the the former director at a Zimbabwe Human Rights NGO Forum was mm -hmm. also denied accreditation. So this is widespread and this is very systematic. It's not, these are not isolated cases. What, what President Nangakwa is trying to do is mask his uh, electoral shenanigans, mask the blatant illegalities that are going to happen on 23 August 2023, and ensure that his party cruises to contested victory without necessarily shedding light on the, on the many illegal acts that will happen on 23 August 2023. So we can only speculate and expect a lot of electoral shenanigans. And I must also say that the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission a few days ago, they said that they are going to follow COVID protocols, the same protocols and rules and regulations that were affected during the COVID-19 lockdowns. So what we can only expect is that there is a high chance that those accredited, those accredited as observers in the 23 August 2023 election will probably be restricted from the polling station because they will say that they will be affecting COVID-19 protocols. But there is no scientific, there's no scientific research into this. Mm. We haven't had any COVID statistics over the past over the past one year. And suddenly this country suddenly is experiencing COVID-19 mm -hmm. cases that will need us that will need the, the state to now, protect the, the polling ta station. Ta so, uh, just before we begin to wind down on this conversation. I would like to follow up on what you said. You did say that Zana PF and uh, President uh, Nangagwa don't seem to care about the international image and perception. Now, given the limited international media coverage, how might opposition voices, the Triple C and other opposition parties in Zimbabwe, uh, and allegations of violence be effectively elevated or addressed within Zimbabwe and on the global stage? How could alternative channels of information dissemination play a role in shaping the public discourse. Uh, if you can, in less than a minute, I would really appreciate. I, I think the hope now lies in local media and local political parties and local CSOs in ensuring that they tell the Zimbabwean story accurately to the world and ensure that our voices are amplified, just like as you're doing right now, amplifying the voice from Zimbabwe itself. I'd like to say a big thank you to my distinguished guests tonight on the program. Tapu Wanashe Chiriga, Advocacy Officer, Hill Zimbabwe Trust, and Dr. Alexander Wissera, International Relations and Political Analyst. All the best with your elections on Wednesday. New Central uh, will definitely be monitoring the situation, and I look forward to speaking uh, with you soon. Thanks for your time and your insights. I'm Benga Borowa.